because we need to be able to predict outcomes of experiments and do all of the things we do in quantum information. So compute some bell inequalities, do steering, some channels. And for this, one, we need one more aspect on, of, of GPTs, and that's the effect algebra. So now the definition of effect algebra is a little bit more involved because effects are affine functions from your state space to the interval of zero, one. Uh, they're affine because we want to respect the structure of convex combinations because we want to say like if you have two states and you, you do the convex combination that's like preparing this half of the time and the other one half of the time or in some kind of ratio and if you measure this we somehow postulate that the measurement outcomes must uh, respect this mixing so that's why they're affine and they're functions to the interval zero one because we want to interpret the outcome as probability and probabilities must be between zero and one the effect algebra is the set of all effects and like one of the most notable things here is the constant function which always gives you one so this is an affine function it goes to the interval zero and one and it's going to be somehow it's going to appear later and uh, the effects generated the dual cone so this is the cone of all positive functionals on the previous cone or on all states and uh well, effect algebra is another starting point for GPTs. You can start with state space. That's what I like because it's easier to explain compact convex sets than effect algebras, but you can start from whichever side you want. It's uh, up to the personal preference. And now armed with this knowledge, uh, you can uh, start constructing more structures in GPTs. You can just construct measurements, channels, entanglements, steering, violations, bell, bell inequalities or bell inequalities in general. Uh, whatever you can do in quantum theory, we can most likely do in GPTs. Uh, there's also some problematic parts like entropy, because there's not a uniquely defined entropy in all GPTs. In quantum theory, it's, uh, well, it's, it's okay enough, but in general, it's not unique, but well, we have a generalized framework, so not everything is as smooth as possible. And why I like to think about GPTs is because, uh, well, as you can see, this is very basic. You can assume that any theory where you can prepare states and randomize preparations and measure the outcome must be a GPT. And in fact, uh, I, I think almost everyone believes that any theory we can get our hands on will most likely be some form of a GPT, maybe with some kind of other generalizations. But in principle, this is so general that uh, uh, most people consider it enough. But also solving problems in GPTs is inherently harder because you have way less of a structure because this is very sim simple framework. But if you solve something in GPTs, you usually understanding so understand it so well enough that applying the solution to quantum theory is it's it's like a corollary. It's like the easy part. It's like the you know, it's it's a nice part. And uh, I'll now try to somehow show show you one of the uh, problems in GPTs and how it can be applied to quantum theory. But before that, I should somehow maybe explain how this actually connects to quantum theory, because, uh, well, this is actually what you know. So well, Martin, can you wait a bit because there's a question for the audience? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, if you have any questions, please shout, because I, if you raise your hand, I, the camera is moving. I don't really see okay. it. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yeah, so I, my question is like you said that basically any physical theory can be casted as a GPT. Uh, so is it like a Okay, so like what are the underlying assumptions on this physical theory because you presented like mathematical formulation right but uh, like for such a statement to be true there have, there have to be some assumptions that you made right yeah yes comment on this yes of course one can actually formal formalize the formalize this in uh more axiomatic fashion and for that it's easier to do it for the state space and here you assume that you have a set of preparations. This is everything that you can do in the lab. Uh, you assume that the set is closed in some kind of uh, topology because you assume that, okay, if I can approximate some state arbitrary well, then I can with, then I can probably prepare that one exactly or so exactly that, uh, or so close that uh, it's basically there. Uh, the third assumption is convexity that you can do these randomized preparations where you basically uh, go in the middle. And uh, uh, then there's one more assumption where you say, where you assume that this is in a finite dimensional vector space. And that's just like uh, for convenience to make, to make uh, our life simpler. Because 
In general, you can formulate, if you would just take uh, this without the finite dimensional assumption, then you get very abstract convex sets, which were of course considered by mathematicians, but they're very hard to work with. So yes. And uh, then what you do is then when, when you have this set of preparations, then you define the possible measurements as all affine functions, or you can go the other way and you can say like, okay, I now have some preparations, now I have some measurements, and now you can say, well, uh, if two preparations give me the same outcome on all possible measurements, then they must be the same preparation because I effectively cannot tell them apart. And if I cannot tell apart two things, then they're the same thing. And uh, this gives you something like, uh, uh, factorization so every state then becomes unique preparation which gives you different experimental outcomes every measurement becomes a unique measurement which gives you different experimental outcomes and uh, then you're there of course these axioms do not tell you how to form something like bipartite state spaces where you have alice and bob and each of them have, have a gpt for that you need to add more axioms about how these compose and where we usually assume local tomography, which means that if you have something like a bipartite state, Alice measures everything, Bob measures everything, then they can uh, do perform perfect tomography. You can drop these assumptions. Some people did. Uh, and that leads to different results. But uh, in general, this is it. Thanks. Yes. OK, so now to motivate that quantum theory is a GPT, well, the state space are the density matrices. As you can, as you probably can guess, and these are positive semi-definite operators with trace one, where the trace equals to one. This is the normalization. This is what picks the bases in the whole cone of uh, positive semi-definite matrices. The effect algebra is given by the operators which are between zero and one, and these are the things we build the OBMs out of, and that's exactly what we want. The, we want the operators we build the OBMs out of, and this is exactly the effect algebra. And then the value of the effect on the state is given by the Born rule. So we just uh, trace them against each other. And this gives you quantum theory as a GPT. And you can already see that the block sphere is a sphere. So it's a compact convex set. And we can just start from there and do everything on. Uh, but the one thing is that this convex formalism somehow forgets that there's an underlying Hilbert space. Uh, because the Hilbert space of the vectors, you don't in the GPT, you don't have access to this. You only have access to density matrices. Of course, you can define pure states, which are the projectors, but you cannot. You can never go down to the Hilbert space because, in general, in the GPT, you don't have the Hilbert space. You only have the state space. And this is what makes it more general, and this is what makes some calculations harder, but this is also what enables other interesting results. Of course, I promise that this will also include classical theory, and it does. And in GPTs, the classical state spaces are simplices, which means this is a state space where all of the pure states are linearly independent. And because they are linear, linearly independent, you can then prove that you can perfectly distinguish all of the pure states. So this is, for example, something you cannot do in quantum theory because the zero state and the plus state, you cannot distinguish them. But in a quantum theory, you can perfectly distinguish all of the pure states, which is somehow obvious because if you give me a classical uh, system, then I can just look at what it is, and this is the distinguishing measurement. So in classical theory, it's somehow very trivial, but one has to still use the full apparatus in order to be able to generalize it. And uh, classical state spaces are very uh, special because one can show that these are the only state spaces where perfect broadcasting of all states is possible. And also, uh, as I proved in, during my PhD, these are the only state spaces where all measurements are compatible, which means that Somehow, there's no com complementarity. There is no generalization of non-commutativity. Basically, if you can measure two things, you can also measure them at the same time, having access to only one state. And uh, yeah, so these are classical theories as uh, state space. Then there's other examples. Most notable one is the box world developed by Jonathan Barrett, uh, which is uh, something completely different and relevant for Bell inequalities. but. Uh, I'll omit uh, exact explanation of that one. Uh, what's more interesting is that one can also do continuous variable GPTs. And this is something we've been working on in Zigan for the past uh, two or three years. Because as I said, for up to now, all of the GPTs were finite dimensional. And after this slide, everything will be again finite dimensional. But we also wanted to see whether you can formulate a GPT of a physical system, so harmonic oscillator, because th that one is quite simple. And we realized that 
you in fact can do this and you can write down uh, GPTs of physical systems, which are different from classical and quantum. And also recently we put on archive a version of this for the hydrogen atom, which was uh, somehow more uh, complicated because for harmonic oscillator, you're Hamiltonian. And yes, there's a Hamiltonian in the GPT of harmonic oscillator and energy measurement. Uh, but for hi hydrogen atom, the time evolution is in ge is more general, more hard to work with because your Hamiltonian is not a polynomial anymore. There's the one over R in potential. And uh, this somehow complicates things. But on the other hand, we managed to do this. And for example, for the hydrogen atom, we were able to compute something like uh, predictions of uh, scattering experiments or perturbations of a general GPT hydrogen atom by uh, lasers and resonant light. So one can do this, and this is an ongoing research, but uh, this is not something I want to talk about today. Today I'm going to talk about, I want to talk about a different question, and uh, this is but, a... Martin, wait, can I have a question? Of course. So what's the motivation to like introduce a GPT theory for a, for a particular system, knowing that like you can describe the system very well in quantum theory? So, uh, what, so, so what's the, you know, what's the aim of that? Uh, some some different theory. So, so uh, for the harmonic oscillator, the aim was to see whether we can do this, because uh, somehow uh, if you have a GPT, you have preparations and measurements. But to have a physical system, you also have to have time evolution and uh, all of the other aspects, like full-fledged mm -hmm. dynamics. And one, for example, knows that uh, in finite-dimensional GPTs, the dynamics are often trivial or doesn't do not give you much of an interesting results. But we want so we would wanted to see if one can at least in principle formulate a different theory of harmonic oscillator if if such a thing even exists if one can even consider an alternative. And uh, but, but you get something that is larger than quantum theory or like like belongs to quantum theory. It's completely in different. Sense? So in what sense? Uh, uh, so for example, for the toy theory we developed. So, so we somehow developed a general procedure and then showcased one toy theory, but uh, the toy theory, toy theory we have has a quantized spectrum. So the harmonic oscillator has uh, quantized eigen eigenvalues mm -hmm. or energy levels, mm -hmm. but they're like zero h bar, h bar omega divided by two and uh, then h bar omega divided by two times n. So it's zero, one half, one, uh, three halves, four, uh, two and so on. So quantized spectrum means it's not classical, but also uh, it violates uh, uh, preparation uncertainty relations. So you, you, valid states of the system are Dirac deltas in phase space, which means it's not quantum. So uh, it's just a completely different theory. OK, thank you. Yeah. And so th this was the motivation. But as I'm going to try to explain, I think that GPTs are also useful for research into quantum information and into practical problems. And uh, we are now working on some kind of uh, uh, results that would uh, where would apply these GPTs uh, in phase space, these continuous variable ones, to obtain uh, uh, relevant results for quantum theory. So somehow the motivations are on on the foundational side, but also on the application side. So the question I'm I, I'm going to tell you something about is like is the question of is there entanglement in every non-classical theory? Because we know that classical theories are the ones where everything is broadcastable, where everything is jointly measurable. And, one, and uh, we know that there's no entanglement in classical theories. And we know that quantum theory is a non-classical theory which has entanglement. So now the question is, can we find entanglement between any non-classical GPTs or, or are there some GPTs which are non-classical but still do not allow for entanglement? So at this point, you can see this as a purely foundational question, uh, which somehow just investigates the nature of entanglement, but okay to maybe give you some background because so that we are all on the same page. In quantum theory, we say that, this, that the state is entangled if, if it's uh, of this form where we cannot write it as a product state. So this 0, 0, 1, 1, these are product states. This one here is a bell pair, which is not product state, so it's entangled. But for mixed states, it's not so easy because then, or it's like, it's still easy, but different because then you say, well, a state is separable if it can be written as a convex combination of uh, product states. And if it's, if it's, it, it is entangled, if it's not separable. And uh, so how do we generalize this to GPTs? Well, 
the first thing to generalize would be this separable thing, because that's something we can easily write down. We know how to do tensor products in vector spaces. We can write this down. And that's exactly the first starting point in GPPs, because you say, OK, let's take two state spaces, and then we can construct this minimal tensor product, which is just the convex combination of all product vectors. So somehow we can see this as a type of tensor product where you have Alice and Bob. Alice has the first state space Ka. Bob has the second state space Kb. And you allow them to prepare any state and talk about it using classical communication. And then they can only prepare states from this uh, set. So it's something like LOCC preparable set from the viewpoint of quantum information. But as I said, there's a, in GPTs, there's a duality between preparations and measurements, because you can start from preparations or you can start from measurements. This starts from preparations, but one can also do the same trick for measurements. And we can, this is called the maximal tensor product. And these are all of the possible states of the system if you allow Alice and Bob to measure only LOCC implementable measurements. So somehow you say that, OK, Alice, you can measure only on your system. Bob, you can measure on your system, which means that the global measurement is on this of this product form. And it must be a valid state of the system, so it, it must give you a positive result. Moreover, it must be normalized because, well, normalization of probabilities. And uh, so these are the two options. But uh, in general, if you have a concrete theory, you usually don't go for one of these options, but you want to go for something in the middle. Because usually your state space of two systems, so if you put two systems together, this is going to be here KAB, which must contain all separable states because you assume that they can at least LOCC prepare any state, but must be contained in the set of all uh, states which are valid on LOCC measurement, because then again, you assume that Alice and Bob can do LOCC implementable measurements. So we get this chain of inclusions, and usually we have something here in the middle. This is also the thing in quantum theory, because in quantum theory, what we would get here, if we would assume Ka and Kb to be quantum systems, then this would be the set of all separable states. This would be your quantum state space given by the tensor product of the Hilbert spaces. And what do you have here? This maximal tensor product would be all matrices which are positive on tensor products of PSD matrices. So people either call this entanglement witnesses or uh, block or block positive matrices. Depends on whether you come from math or physics. But we know that the quantum state space is exactly in the middle because we have entangled states in quantum theory, but we also have entangled measurements. So it must be strictly bigger than the separable thing, but strictly smaller than the maximal thing. And now the question at hand is, well, OK, so if I know that the two state spaces are uh, non-classical, are, are the two bounding points different? So is the minimal tensor product different from the maximal tensor product? Because if, if they're the same, there cannot be no entanglement. But if they are different, they're at least in principle can be some either entangled states or entangled measurements, or you postulate that there is none. But at that point, uh, the mathematics is not forbidding you from having entanglement. It's your postulates that are doing that. So this is the first question. We want to know when these two tensor products are different. And uh, now, if you would uh, go through all of the slides, try to write this down for classical theory, you would soon realize that for classical theory, they're always the same. So if one of the state spaces is classical, the minimal and maximal thing are the same, which just means that if Alice has a classical system here and Bob has any other system, well, there cannot be any entanglement between them because you cannot entangle yourself to a classical system because it's classical. And this was already observed by George Barker in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. And there's a very nice paper about uh, that in linear algebra and its applications. But this is actually pure mathematical paper, and it's not even talking about state spaces or GPTs. He's just talking about the cones which contain the state spaces, because in some sense, you can boil down this problem to the underlying cones, and you don't care about the state space, you just care about the cone. And this is very nice, because uh, if you have these cones, uh, you, you, you are just working with ordered vector spaces. So somehow, this is a prob problem in mathematics, in algebra, about ordered vector spaces and their tensor products. And this is where the mathematical thing begins, because now we forget that this problem comes from GPTs, and we just want to solve a mathematical problem. And for 40 years, nothing happened. And then after uh, struggling for a few years with collaborators, we managed to prove that, well, if your state spaces are non-classical, then always these two things are different, and you always can have some entanglement between your two state spaces. 
this was actually not very simple proof, but uh, in, in the end, after uh, generalizing all of our ideas, we managed to prove this, uh, which was very interesting collaboration because uh, we did not even have Zoom calls back then because the pr proof was finished in uh, 2019. And I did not even know, know back then that Zoom existed, but uh, we just did everything over emails and it was very nice. So you can find that if you're interested, the original proof is uh, in Geometric and Functional Analysis published in 2021. But then we also wrote a, a physics-oriented version of the proof, which made it to PRL, where we somehow uh, connect our ideas to existence of generalized two propositions, because somehow the proof goes that if you have two non-classical, uh, if you have two cones generated by non-classical state spaces, we know that they can be entangled and we can construct something entangled between them if they have some kind of property. And so then the goal was to prove that every non-classical cone has this property, which is nice because instead of having to care about two cones, you just care about one cone and prove that it has some kind of property. So it somehow like cuts, cuts your problems in, in half. And uh, once we prove this, we realized that, okay, but this property, it's some, it's, it would be reasonable to call this generalized proposition because somehow we require that there's like two pairs of states and measurements that can distinguish these states and the, the lines between the states like intersect each other. So think of something like zero and one and plus and minus states. The structure that the zero, one plus minus states give you, this gives you entanglement in quantum theory. And we somehow then in this PRL explain how this gives you entanglement in any theory, which is non-classical because in order to have this structure, it must be non-classical. And that's if and only if. So, but yes, but the first paper is uh, pure math. Wait, so, so I have a question. So what do you consider, uh... I mean, this this Ka. Uh, so what, when you call Ka to be uh, non-classical, I mean, if it's like, if it's, if it's not a simplex, if it's not, okay. if it's so, not what? so uh, your pure states are finally dependent. Mm -hmm. uh, I I have a question. Yes. Can, can you hear me? Uh, so could you please repeat how come that the difference between uh, minimal and maximal tensor product is sort of akin to entanglement. Uh, yes, that's here. Because uh, the minimal tensor product is the set of all separable states, while the maximal tensor product is the- Ah, uh, the weaknesses, okay, okay, okay. The, But you should see the maximal tensor product as the biggest possible set of states, which is still well-defined on uh, separable measurements. So somehow the minimal one is the smallest one, which you should have, and the maximal one is the biggest one. If you go bigger than maximal, then uh, some of some product measurements are not allowed, which is probably not not okay. And if you go smaller than separable, then some product preparations are not allowed, which is again but, strange. Uh, pardon, but can you uh, so so here you show that these two products, uh, yeah, that these two products are um, uh, different whenever both of the Ka can be a uh, non-classical, but. If you go back to the statistics of uh, so the probabilities, the statistics of measurements, do you see it there also somehow some violations or some sort of Bell inequalities? Or? We don't know. Ah, okay. So, okay. So somehow so you, you, now you have just this. Well, just now you have this mathematical fact that uh, whenever Ka can be a um, non-simplex then the minimal and maximal tensor products will be different, right? Yes. So somehow in order to prove this, uh, that this thing is not equal to that thing, we construct something which is provably entangled and we prove the entanglement by computing something like CHSH inequality, but it's not really CHSH because the things we put there are not really well normalized measurements and we did not figure out how to uh, how to prove that uh, for any non-classical state spaces you can have violations of Bell inequalities? But if you say if you say entanglement and you don't have uh, uh, here, uh, you don't have vector spaces, or you have vector spaces here. Yes, everything oh, lives yeah. in some vector space. Uh, okay, uh, but this is vector space in the sense of vector space of all matrices in quantum theory. Okay. 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 I'm sorry, can you elaborate uh, what you mean by uh, generalized proposition, sort of operationally? Uh, 
So uh, by generalized superposition, I mean that there's two pairs of states. So uh, pair one and pair two, such that uh, uh, the first pair, you can perfectly distinguish the states in the first pair, and you can also perfectly distinguish the states in the second pair. But the if you do something like 50-50 uh, uh, superposition or some, uh, not superposition, mixture of these states or some mixture of the first pair and some mixture of the second pair, the, the lines overlap. So, so, the same state. Okay. so think about something like zero, one plus minus. You can distinguish zero, one, you can distinguish plus minus, but in the middle, they, the lines connecting these pairs overlap. So do you think that this, uh, mm, like, uh, that in any non-classical GPT, this generalized uh, value inequality, uh, the, the, Say no locality exists or, or not? Like, what's your mm, wait? You mean the general sure. superposition or violations of Bell inequalities? No, no, violation of Bell inequalities. What do you think? I I don't know. I I think so, but m there are some cases where maybe one can construct uh, something where no violation is possible. I'm not exactly sure. The the, th the thing is that if uh, uh, your state spaces are of the same type, then uh, I would say probably yes. But if they're of a different type, then no. Because here, you know, like one state space can be something quantum and the other state space can be something that uh, replaces quantum theory in a different galaxy and entanglement would still exist. But somehow with violations of Bell inequalities, this can be harder. So this is still an open question. Uh, to the extent that when I was writing, uh, because two years ago I wrote a review paper on GPTs, so you can find it in the archive, and uh, in this review I wanted to prove many properties of non-classical GPTs from this generalized superposition, but in the end I realized that this is not so easy and that uh, one would need to work on this way more, so then I somehow did not do this in the review and still have it on a list. Thanks. So, uh, well, but okay, so now we know entanglement exists, but uh, the thing is like, how do we detect entanglement? Because uh, the thing is that uh, when we were writing this original paper, so this one in the geometric and functional analysis, at some point we want to say that, okay, if you have these generalized superpositions, this is how we construct the state. It's not separable because of this and it's in, uh, because of this. And to say, to show that it's not separable, we have to, we have we had to do an explicit calculation. And what you see here are just two one and a half page from the paper, which is like a short excerpt from this calculation. In fact, I did this calculation myself first, and it takes 12 pages of simplifying formulas of this form. And uh, we submitted this for review. We submitted it to math journal. So the report came back uh, something like one year later, because that's the standard thing for math journals. And uh, the referee said, like, OK, this is OK. You proved it, so it's true. And that's well enough for mathematics. But somehow the referee commented that the proof is really not nice. And uh, it's just something like, now you sit down for six hours and simplify these things until you get something like, because all of these things you have here somehow simplifies to the small formula here at the end. Uh, I hope you can see my cursor where I'm pointing. Not really. Well, we, we can we can see the the your cursor, but we, we don't see the formulas. Uh, just see some lines on the wall. Yeah, but okay, you don't have to see the specifics. It's just like the two lines at the end. And uh, I remember this that we discussed this with my collaborators on uh, Friday evening uh, via emails. And uh, at at some point, I said that okay, this well, this is true. Maybe we can uh, have a different proof, a simpler one, because we can say like, uh, well, if it's separable, it must have this, uh, it must have this uh, property of of symmetric extendability that I'm going to explain soon enough, and probably it is not going to have that property because it should simplify in this case like this, and everything which should hold. Uh, to which uh, Guillaume, uh, the first author on the paper, one of my collaborators, collaborators replied that, yes, this sounds uh, reasonable, but they were trying to prove this for a year and didn't manage to do this. So I, this felt like a challenge, and this felt like a very nice challenge. So the next hour I spent looking up uh, the 
proofs about how one can one does this in quantum theory because this is a known uh, proof technique in quantum theory. But uh, then it was six o'clock and uh, I was at home because it was during the lockdown. So I went to have my dinner and uh, then uh, uh, spent some time with my family, put the children to bed. And then at eight, I told to my wife like, okay, I'm sorry, but uh, now this evening I have something in my head, I have to work. At this point, my wife already knows me. So she, she, she knew that at this point, it's like doing anything else is pointless. And I just have to look at this. And I remember that, uh, I ended up at one in the morning sending an email to all of the collaborators saying that, hey, if we generalize this proof like this and do this differently and this holds, then we get the proof in all GPTs. And this is what I'm going to explain now. So it was essentially done in like one night, but then it involved way more work. Yes? So I just said in one evening. No yes. <laughs> well, well the, the, the first part, and there's a second part of the paper, which was done in many months. But here's the idea. If we have a separable state, so X, A, B, then it can be written in this separable decomposition as a sum of uh, convex combination of product states. But then for any N, we can construct what we call symmetric extension, where you just take the B system and just add the tensor power. So you just copy the B system many, many more times. And you can surely do this because it's just a very simple construction. Just take the decomposition and write down the what we call symmetric extension, this psi. And from this, you already get one implication. If your state is separable, it must have any symmetric extension for any n. Now, the goal was to prove the other implication that if you have symmetric extension for any n, the state must be separable. This is known as the DPS hierarchy in uh, quantum theory. And we wanted to get this in all GPTs, or rather say for all cones, because at this point we were still thinking as mathematicians and writing this down for cones and not for GPTs. But, uh, and this is what we managed to do. This is actually the result of one evening where uh, we realized that, where I realized that, okay, this actually is true. And if you have a state that then it's separable if and only if the symmetric extension exists for every n, which means there's something like a state of many copies of Bob, which is invariant with respect to permuting the copies of Bob. And if you apply this thing here, you get back the original state. But the thing here that you apply to the extension, this is just, see this as a partial trace because what you do is that you do identity on a so nothing identity on b1 so nothing and you apply the unit the the constant function on everything else but the constant function that just the trace so this is just a partial trace and so if you work in entanglement theory you, you already know this this is the dps hierarchy but now for any any uh dpp or any cones this is quite a nice result because it uh, allows us to detect entanglement in GPTs. And uh, uh, then, of course, we did not stop here, but uh, we also characterized all state spaces or equivalent where this hierarchy is finite because we realized that sometimes you have like a very special state space where you just cut off the hierarchy at the finite end, and that's it. You just test it up to that end, and anything else is trivial. So uh, that's the second half of the paper that took a few more months to finish. Was there a question? No. Well, actually, I wanted to ask something. So, so this uh, Doherty Pironio, I forgot the first, uh, not Pironio. So like, Doherty Sambazi. Sorry. Very low. Very low. I'm sorry, like, I don't hear you very, very well. Sorry. So this hierarchy has, like, appro has approximate versions in in quantum theory, right? Like, if you just know that you, you know. For finite dimensional systems specifically, so can you can you, uh, is it uh, like is it possible to prove uh, analogous statement for GPTs? Uh, I would have to know what approximation you have in mind. Well, like typically one considers one norm, right? Like you you kind of you know it's more like a quantitative question. So like how close your state is to a separable state, right? Uh, oh. And you know that if it has a symmetric extension of certain degree, then it will be like the higher the degree of the extension, the, the closer you can find the separable state. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes, yes, you can, you can do things like this because then you are just uh, approximating over the set of n extendable states and uh, looking for some property. So yes, you can write this down or 
Well, I would have to see this. I would have to look at the specifics, but most likely, yes. Thanks. Yep. All right. So uh, we have a generalized DPS hierarchy, which can detect entanglement in GPTs. But well, now for something completely different, because now I have to explain the problem, uh, which one can actually solve using this approach. So now we've been to foundations, we've been to mathematics, now we go to quantum information and to actually useful results. So if we have a quantum state, uh, it, it can be entangled. And this is good because we need entanglement for protocols. But also, one, not all entanglement is equal, and one can somehow quantify that some entanglement is better than, than uh, other entanglement, because uh, even for uh, vector states, uh, you have, for example, something as a Schmidt rank, which uh, tells you, like, uh, if, you, if you have an entangled state, then you can decompose it in this form, this Schmidt decomposition, and the Schmidt rank is the number of summons you have to have here. So Schmidt rank 1, separable, Schmidt rank 2, non-separable, and Schmidt rank higher, also not separable. And in principle, we want to have as high Schmidt rank as possible because the higher Schmidt rank, the in some sense, the more your state is robust to noise. Well, at least for some states, but uh, in principle, one can say high Schmidt rank good. So how do we quantify Schmidt rank for mixed states? Because, well, we will be working with mixed states, whatever we do. Well, we have to introduce Schmidt number where we say that, okay, this state has a Schmidt number K. If we can decompose it as a convex sum, of uh, Schmidt rank K states. Of course, some of the people can now object that this is not this is not the uniquely best measure of high dimensionality of usefulness of entanglement because somehow we can have like one state which has Schmidt rank K and the number in front of it can be very small and you can have a lot of states with Schmidt rank two and a lot of separate a lot of product states. And uh, this is not really a high dimensional entanglement, but this is the one measure that I'm going to be use, use now, and uh, one can also consider other ones, but this is the one we work with. So this is uh, dimensionality of entanglement, and in principle, we want to have high dimensional entanglement, but also we have to certify that the entanglement is high dimensional because somebody can tell you like, hey, I can make Schmidt number 10 states. And you so say like, okay, but how do I trust this person? This is like a private company. They can be selling me something completely useless. How do I know that I can trust them? How do I know that it does what it does? And so for this, one has to develop something which actually uh, tests whether a state has a high enough Schmidt number. Moreover, the way we want to test this is in a semi-device independent way or in a steering uh, scenario. And what's this? Well, we have a state between two parties, A and B. A is for Alice, B is for Bob. And uh, the thing is, we don't trust the state, but we also don't trust the Alice. Because imagine the state was prepared in Russia, Alice is someone in China. You don't want to trust any of them. You just trust what you have. And this is the scenario we want to work with. And it, it can be actually done. And this is also done experimentally. So what we do is that we assume that we have this state between Alice and Bob. We are the Bob. We don't trust Alice. We don't trust the state. And Alice measures something. We don't know what Alice measures, but we know that Somehow she measures something which has some kind, which gives her an outcome. And she doesn't measure one measurement, but she has several measurements between which she can choose from. So here, this A labels outcomes, this X labels the POVM or the measurement Alice performs. Once this happens, we as the Bob obtain what we call assemblage. So basically, this is the Alice's POVMs acting on the state. We partial trace over Alice, we get this assemblage. And now the question is can we bound the Schmidt number, number of the state? From just given the knowledge of the assemblage. And so this is the question we wanted to solve. So it's now purely quantum information stuff. And well, one thing that we know about Schmidt number K states is that you can decompose them in this kind of fashion, where here you have some something separable between with ancillary Hilbert spaces, A prime and B prime. These are K dimensional, where K is exactly the Schmidt number. And this pi K is, is uh, some kind of projection, projection some kind of... Uh, operator you have here and this is this been this has been known for maybe 15 years i think and has been used before but now if we plug this formula into the into the one formula we had before for assemblage we get that okay if the assemblage comes from a schmidt number k state well it must be of this form where now we can denote all of this here as omega a x where this tau this is yet another assemblage that comes from alice applying her povm to 
to the states here in the separable decomposition coming from the Schmidt rank K. So we basically get some kind of formula that you have an assemblage. If it's of this form given by this formula, the state is Schmidt number K, or at least it looks like it has Schmidt number K given these measurements. Okay, but what what do we do now with this? Well, what have here? What we have here? This omega a given x. This is something like a separable product of assemblage and quantum state, because as I said, these tau's they're assemblages, and these rows they're quantum states. Well, in quantum theory, we know how to detect entanglement between two quantum states, but here we have to detect entanglement between assemblage and quantum state, and this is not a quantum problem because assemblages, although they are quantum objects, the, the state space of all assemblages is not the quantum state space, it's something else. So if you want to now detect entanglement here, what you can do is that we can use the generalized DPS hierarchy because that worked for all GPTs, and we, we just have a separability problem in some GPTs. And this is what we can exactly do because now we can prove this theorem that, okay, if this state is uh, separable, then it must be Schmidt number K or equivalently, it is, if it has symmetric extensions, which gives you this hierarchy that we had be, before, then it's separable. But uh, now the hierarchy must be formulated in a GPT sense, which means that this is not just the usual DPS hierarchy. It's like DPS hierarchy with extra constraints. Because the nice thing is that even though assemblages, they, are, they don't form a quantum state space, they still consist of PSD matrices and you can write, write this as a SDP problem. So in the end, what we get is that Using the results before on uh, DP hierarchy in GPTs, one gets the tight SDP hierarchy for semi-defined independent certif certification of Schmidt number. And moreover, once this was implemented, this gave better bounds than almost anything that was known before, which I think is a very nice result because this somehow starting from this entanglement problems in foundations and mathematical problems of tensor products of ordered vector spaces one now can apply this to a useful problem of uh, certifying Schmidt number of states, get a SDP hierarchy, which can be computed on computers. You can just write this down and computer will give you a number and then you can interpret this number as some kind of noise bound. And it actually works quite well. And uh, yes, so with this application of the previous results, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And please, if you have any questions or comments, uh, I would be happy to answer them. Thanks, Marty, for your nice talk. Do we have any questions? Okay, so maybe I have some questions. So the first question is, do you know any uh, application, quantum information application of, of states that have certain Schmidt number or Schmidt rank? I think the most interesting thing is the noise robustness that uh, from Schmidt number and Schmidt rank, you get higher noise robustness than uh, with lower one. Yeah, okay, but, but do you know any application in which like the, if you have a higher Schmidt number, you, I don't know, with higher probability, you can well, guess something or do something better. No, I'm sorry, no. And would you be able to, so why you formulate this for the semi-device dependent formalis? Why not for like device dependent? So why cannot the like Schmidt number with the violation of the normality, the inequalities? This is somewhat of a coincidence because uh, this problem was considered before by uh, Rope Ula, who used to be a PhD student uh, in Siegen, and uh, he was interested in this and uh, wanted to somehow get better, like this, we discussed this in Siegen and wanted to get a better bound. And uh, so that's somehow why we went on with this formulation. But in principle, something as a follow-up work that we are working on is that if you assume that uh, both Alice and Bob measure, then what you get here is not just a separability between the uh, assemblage and quantum state, but between two assemblages. And you can do the same, uh, you can apply the same tricks and again, get a SD, SDP hierarchy for uh, detecting this. Although in for detecting uh, Schmidt rank with Bell inequalities, uh, this, some, this becomes something, this essentially becomes something close to detecting uh, local dimension of the yeah, exactly. It is with bell inequalities, and then this is uh, experimentally harder to do. While this uh, uh, steering approach, this was actually done experimentally recently, so we went with this one. Okay. Any other question? So, are there any questions from the audience uh, that is online? Okay. So, if there are no further questions, let's thank Martin again. So, thank you, Martin. See you. Thank you very much. <laughs>